Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Microsexual Exchange. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Andreas Park. I'm at the University of Toronto, and I'm co-moderating the session together with Katya Malinova from McMaster University. Um, today, we have a paper on ETFs, illiquid sales and fire sales, which will be presented by Karmfil Todorov from the BIS, and it's joint work with uh, John Shim. Before we start, I want to briefly point you to a uh, conference announcement, which we put into the email today, but because most of you probably have just deleted the email without reading it carefully, uh, we're going to post the link to that conference into the chat. It's a conference organized by the NYSE uh, on microstructure and AI. And as Andre pointed out to us earlier, one of the interesting parts about this is that the conference discussions will be from industry. So if you're looking for insights on whether or not your research at all is insightful and relevant for them, there you go. That's the place to be. With that, I'm going to uh, hand over the floor to Karmfil Torov, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Just as a quick note, uh, Karmfil said that he is absolutely comfortable with you interrupting him at any point in time and asking him questions. So let's go with that. Uh, Karmfil, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks a lot, um, Andres. Um, thanks also to Andre and Katya and Bjorn and the rest of the organizers for selecting this paper. So this is a joint work with uh, John Shim who's at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, the usual disclaimer applies, those are our views, not the views of the BS. And the title of the talk is ETFs, Liquid Assets and Fire Cells. So I'm gonna tell you about how ETFs can actually prevent fire cells in corporate bonds, which are uh, generally illiquid assets. Um, so let me go over the um, motivation for why we wrote this paper. Well, first of all, we study corporate bond ETFs because they're been growing massively over the last decade. So as of last year, they were managing almost $2 trillion of assets globally, which is more than five times their assets under management over the, um, compared, to last decade, compared to a decade ago. Um, so first reason is because these ETFs are just growing exponentially. And the second one is that they've always been a source of criticism because of the inherent illiquidity mismatch between the very liquid ETF market where people buy and sell ETF shares and the very illiquid underlying corporate bond market where people trade corporate bonds. Um, so just to give you two examples from industry, um, from the industry. So here we put two quotes by famous bond investors, Carl Icahn and Bill Gross, who essentially articulate the same concern that um, there is significant selling pressure in the ETF market, which is pretty liquid. If that selling pressure is transmitted to the very illiquid corporate bond market, it can potentially spark a fire sale. If everyone rushes for the exit at the same time, as Bill Gross is, is, is calling this, um, this concern, that it might be the, the door might be too narrow to fit everyone um, to, through the exit at the same time. Um, so that's basically the question that motivated this paper. And more specifically, we study how connected is the ETF market to the, to the underlying corporate bond market. If the two markets are pretty well connected, then if there are selling pressure in the ETF market, that's basically transmitted pretty easily to the illiquid corporate bond market. It can cause a far sell. But if the two markets are not that well connected, maybe there is a buffer that actually is beneficial in terms of fire sales because ETFs could prevent the transmission of the selling pressure from the ETF market to the corporate bond market. And that's exactly what we show actually in this paper through a, a formal model. Um, so we basically study how the transmission works from the ETF market to the corporate bond market and the other way around. And we build this very simple model to transmit to understand how these shocks are transmitted. And we find that there is a significant asymmetry between creations. So when people want to buy ETF shares and the uh, authorized participant, who is a set of is basically investor who can create and redeem ETF shares. And usually that's one of the big banks like Bank of America or Goldman Sachs or, or, or JP Morgan. So when people want to buy ETF shares in a creation, the AP transmits the buying pressure one-to-one. -one. So if there is a hundred dollars of creation in ETF share, in ETF shares, the AP just goes and buys hundred dollars of corporate bonds. So basically the transmission of Creations is just one to one to the underlying corporate bond market, to the underlying corporate bond market. But when you have a redemption and people sell the ETF shares, the AP behaves in an asymmetric way. So he only transmits part of the selling pressure to the underlying corporate bond market. Um, and that inherent asymmetry basically is what, what allows the ETF to act as a buffer and stop the transmission of selling shocks in times of redemption from the ETF market to the corporate bond market. Um, and the source of this asymmetry is because a, in reality, authorized participants like the, as I said, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, they have a bond trading desk, so they have inventory in the underlying bonds, which creates a skin in the game. 
Um, so in terms of fire sales, they don't want the fire sales to be transmitted to the bond market because they need to mark down their existing bond inventory. And that's why they have this skin in the game, which um, which makes them behave asymmetrically in terms of in terms of redemptions compared to in terms of creations. I'm going to explain the mechanism pretty in pretty um, pretty much detail when I go over the over the model. Um, and that that basically that buffer that the AP is providing to the ETF is not for free because um, the AP needs to put the redeemed bonds on his balance sheet and then to wait for the storm to to pass by. But that's, of course, not free because putting bonds on balance sheet is pretty costly, especially in terms of stress. So who is paying for this cost? Those are the liquidity demanding ETF investors. So people who run for the exit and they want to sell their ETF shares, they pay for this cost of APs um, that, that APs face to put bonds on balance sheet via large discounts. So basically, whoever is rushing for the exit, he sells the ETF at a lower price compared to the net asset value from the like holdings, or in other words, for a large discount. Um, the model also predicts that um, inventory is a major source driving discounts. So if, uh, if APs have larger inventory in particular type of bonds, that means larger discounts for this type of bonds in terms of fire sales. And that actually helps us explain some of the puzzling COVID-19 patterns that we saw in March 2020. So that, that puzzling pattern was that investment grade bonds, which are generally more liquid and safer, they were trading at, at larger discounts compared to um, more illiquid and riskier high yield bonds. So basically, high yield bonds have small discounts compared to investment grade bonds, which is puzzling from the existing, from the point of view of the existing ETF theories. But our model provides an explanation for that puzzling pattern. And also, our model shows that ETFs, in some sense, are better suited in managing liquid assets compared to other investment vehicles like mutual funds, because they have this buffer that prevents the transmission of fire sales, and that buffer is not present in mutual funds. Um, so let me just make sure that we are on the same page in terms of how. ETFs work and how in particular ETF creations and redemptions work. So as I said, there's a set of investors called authorized participants who can create new or redeem existing ETF shares. And they do so because they want to capture the difference between the ETF price and the net asset value of underlying holdings. So they want to exploit the arbitrage between the ETF price and the net asset value of underlying holdings. So for example, if the ETF is too expensive relative to the net asset value of holdings, which is the situation where the ETF is trading a premium, and it's, the, and it's depicted in the lower left uh, graph here, the, the APs want to buy the creation basket, um, use it to create new ETF shares, and they short the ETF. So basically, they short the ETF here, they buy the creation basket, and they push this price down and this price up until the point when there is no arbitrage and the ETF price is equal to the net asset value of underlying holdings. Similarly, if the ETF price is too cheap compared to the net asset value of underlying holdings, which is the situation where we see a discount, then the ETFs, then the APs have the, uh, they do the opposite strategy. So they buy the cheap ETF and they sell the redemption basket. And then they redeem the ETF for the underlying basket of bonds. Um, so what is important in this arbitrage for corporate bond ETFs is that the set of bonds that they use to create new ETF shares, the green uh, circle here, is different from the holdings of the ETF. So for example, if you have uh, 500 bonds in your benchmark, when you create new ETF shares, you only deliver a subset of those 500 bonds. And usually that's around 20%, so 100 bonds. And the same thing happens for redemption. So instead of redeeming 500 bonds that are part of your holdings, you only redeem a, a fraction of that, usually around 25% of, of those holdings. And as you see on this graph here, so the creation basket, the, the green circle, is different from the redemption basket in many cases. So the set of bonds that you use to create new ETF shares is different from the set of bonds that you get when you redeem your ETF shares. Um, and sometimes you can actually deliver bonds that are never held by the ETF. So as you see, this, this small area here uh, illustrates bonds that are never held by the ETF, but you deliver them create, to create new ETF shares. Um, so that's feature of corporate bonds that we call in a, in a previous version of this paper, fractional baskets, because only fraction of the bonds are involved in the actual ETF arbitrage. Um, and we study that those fractional baskets in a separate paper, uh, but just to make sure that we're on the same page because we use fractional baskets in the model as one of the assumptions. I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone is on the same page in terms of what fractional baskets mean. Um, I think it's a good point to stop if there are any questions related to the main findings or to the ETF arbitrage here. So what yeah. are the rules around this? Are you The way you describe this is, is what they do. Is there a particular approach that prompts them to have a liquidity buffer available? Um, you mean for the choice of baskets or for the behavior of the authorized participants? For the AP's um, behavior. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically, the, the logic here is that they have existing inventory in bonds, and then they don't want to depress the market value of that existing inventory because that basically increases their leverage or potentially makes their capital ratios worse. 
So what they're interested in is they want to keep the mark to market value um, uh, insulated from transmission of shocks. And that's why they, they would like to put bonds on balance sheet instead of sell them on the bond market and depress bond prices, which means that they need to mark down the existing inventory in, the, in those same bonds. So that's basically the idea here. You don't want to mark down your existing inventory. So you want to prevent the, the bond prices from, from dropping because that hurts yourself through the existing inventory channel. That's the, that's the buffer. So um, just just to be clear, I don't want to um, mm -hmm. talk the conversation, but I, I was just really wondering if there's actually firm rules around this because it seems to be that there could be a, a particular risk that you know you have if the if the bond is not if the ETF is not fully fully funded or the like, right? So mm -hmm. um, are there rules around um, how much they actually have to hold? Right, like um, so they're not, they're like firm not... regulatory rules that that determine what they have to have. Um, so as far as I know, there are no regulatory rules in terms of which bonds you need to have in your inventory in order to be authorized participant. Um, generally, it could be bonds that are that are part of the ETF benchmark or that the, the ETF sponsor is ready to accept for creation um, or other ETF sponsors are ready to accept for creation or potentially bonds that you can um, find clients for. But there are no strict regulatory rules which types of bonds you need to hold in balance sheet in order to be able to be authorized participant. Um, has a question too. Can I can I just comment here that um, from the perspective of an ETF sponsor that you know it's always one to one, right? So in other words, the ETF is always holding securities. Sometimes they hold cash. Sometimes they're holding the bonds. Uh, as Carmfield correctly pointed out, the creation baskets and the redemption baskets may be subsets of the of the holdings. Uh, but the way we do it in iShares is we use a, a, a fixed income risk model. Uh, to accurately uh, track the index. So at the end of the day, the goal is to have minimal tracking error. We're not going to take a basket from the authorized participant unless it satisfies that criteria. And we run a risk model on every basket that's submitted to us. Uh, similarly, um, on the redemption side of, of Karen Phil's chart here, uh, as we start to see in, initially at the start of the day, the redemption basket is full of things that are creating tracking errors. So maybe we have too many energy bonds. So energy bonds are in the redemption baskets. Maybe we have long duration. So long duration bonds are part of the um, part of the redemption basket. As the day goes on, as we get more and more redemptions, let's say it's a really bad day and we're getting a billion dollars of redemptions, that R circle on the right hand side of the chart is going to expand to be the holding. We're going to give them a perfect slice of the fund because that's what preserves the minimal tracking error. So just for context, that's how it, it works um, for iShares. Thank you. Very useful. Um, sorry, we have a few questions. Uh, so Pankai was first and then Andre after. Yeah, thank you. So I think I have a, a little bit of the opposite where the you're saying this would uh, sort of mitigate because the APs are able to hold in their own account. But what about the levered ETF, right? So there they have to rebalance and it may be 2x or 3x. So actually, the pressure that will create on the main market will be phenomenally, I mean, exponentially higher in that case, uh, significantly increasing the risks, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so what we focus in this paper is unleveraged ETFs. So not just plain vanilla ETFs that hold physical assets. The one that you mentioned are leveraged ETFs, and they usually do that by entering into swaps uh, or futures. And that's how they lever up the exposure. They usually don't hold physical assets. They enter into a swap agreement to get that leverage. And those ETFs, they, are, they have this um, tendency to buy when the market goes up and sell when the market goes on. As I correctly said, they actually um, they actually contribute to, to the price impact. So when the market tanks, they need to sell. Um, but it, it's less. So these type of ETFs are not that large in corporate bonds as share of the total market compared to other asset classes like commodities or VIX for which um, that could be a bigger problem. For example, in 2018, these ETFs were pretty big. They were around 50% of the market for VIX, and one of them went bankrupt, um, exactly because it's type of feedback loop, like uh, similar to gamma gamma, gamma uh, trading, uh, gamma hedging. Right. I mean, there will still be a spillover effect even if they use futures, because people would want to arbitrage, right? So anyway, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and Andrew Kirilenko was next. Yeah, hi, thanks. I, I, uh, it is, you, you refer to banks, but it is my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, a significant proportion of uh, authorized participant activity is by uh, high frequency traders like Jane Street and, and the like. So uh, they pr may have a 
somewhat different behavior. You know, they may not have balance sheet considerations or other considerations that, that you refer to here and they uh, and that sort of thing. Does it matter at all for you? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So basically, Jane Street is one of the biggest authorized participants in this um, in, in this market. But as far as so I'm going to show you some um, empirical hypothesis that we test. Um, and the empirical hypothesis show you that basically whoever is the marginal IP doing the question redemption has to hold at least some inventory in the bonds. And then as long as they have some inventory in the bonds, they're going to prevent the transmission of shocks to the bond market because that hurts their mark market values. The only case where they wouldn't act as a buffer uh, is if they have zero inventory. And even in that case, they would still prevent the, um, the jump in pricing by cost, but they're less likely to do so. Um, and, and in reality, I guess Jane Street, given that they're also on the creation side, so they, so they create bonds and they redeem bonds. Um, and we have an extension model with multiple APs that shows that the AP with the biggest inventory is the one that have the has the smallest cost in creating bonds. So in that sense, having some inventory uh, gives you some advantage in, in, um, in creating um, ETF shares compared to other APs. And the outcome, the equilibrium income, uh, the, the equilibrium outcome, be that the marginal IP has at least some in the, during the underlying bonds. And then the mechanism of our model is actually is, is what's um, is, is going to hold because the, the AP has skin in the game. Um, so in reality, indeed, we, we show some, um, we developed this model hypothesis and then we test them in the data and they show that the marginal IP has some inventory in the, in the underlying bonds. So it's not a, an AP with zero inventory like high frequency trader. Um, or if the high frequency trader is trading, then the, the trader still holds, holds some inventory in the underlying bonds. Okay, and then uh, next question is, um, I'm, I hope, uh, Andre, your question has been answered. Um, next question would be from Sean Donahue. I, I had a quick question about the uh, net asset value. In this mm -hmm. model that you have, is this the value of the underlying basket at any moment, or is this the, the NAV at 4 p.m. Eastern? Uh, the nav what? Sorry, can you repeat the the last part? Oh, it, the when you when you're describing nav premium, I was wondering whether this is the under value of the underlying basket at any moment yep. throughout the trading day, or if you have in mind the price at the four p.m. at the at the close. It's at any any time during the trading day. So whenever you see this deviation, you could lock in um, the difference by locking basically the price at that moment in the day, and then delivering the basket for that point in during the day. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, no more questions, I see. So why don't you just move on? Yep. Um, so let me jump then to the model um, and show you how ETFs um, could prevent the transmission of far sales to the corporate bond market. So there are three key ingredients of the model that corresponds to what's happening in, in the real world. So first, corporate bonds are less liquid than the ETF shares. And then they are so illiquid that if you want to try, if you try, if you try to sell large quantities of bonds in times of stress, that could spark a fire sale. The second one is that, um, as I said, APs are usually dealers in the bond market. So uh, as, as, the, uh, one, as the big banks, as I said, Bank of America, JP Morgan, it could be also high frequency traders like Jane Street, but they, the, um, the real world fact is that they hold inventory in the underlying bonds, uh, as shown in this paper here by Pan and Zeng. And then the third fact that um, was something that we covered in the previous version of this paper, which is now a separate paper, is that bond ETFs utilize these fractional baskets. So as you saw in the previous graph, only a fraction of the bonds are involved in the actual creation and redemption of ETF shares. Um, so there are two bonds, A and B, that are equally held by the ETF. And the prices of bond A is equal to price of bond B, is equal to price of the ETF, and is equal to some initial quantity P0. And in line with fractional baskets, only one of the two bonds, so only bond A, is part of the, uh, of the basket. So it's used to create new ETF shares or um, is given to the AP when and when the AP redeems ETF shares. Um, so there are two types of agents. So there is a representative AP that holds inventory Z in, um, in, uh, in units of each bond. And what is important in this case is that it's inventory in bond A. And he trades with the ETF investor who needs to trade just for exogenous reason. And the ETF investor needs to buy or sell quantity Q of ETF shares, which then the AP buys or, or sells to, the, to that investor. Um, so the AP is always providing liquidity to that exogenous ETF investor. Um, and then there is a there is an illiquid corporate bond market. So if you sell quantity of bonds X, you have a pricing by cost of C times X. And if you sell more than threshold tau, um, you're gonna face a much larger price impact of F, which stands for fire sales, F times X. Um, and the logic here is similar to the classic Schleifer-Vishni fire sale type of story that 
In normal times, you can sell bonds to specialist investors, but in times of fire sales, when the specialist investors are constrained, you need to go to outsiders who have a low valuation for the bond, and that's why you face a larger price impact cost of F times the quantity that you sell. Um, then we solved the model for the two basic cases, for redemptions and for creations. And for redemptions, the authorized participant chooses to hold a fraction of the redeemed bonds gamma to maximize the price that he quotes to the redeeming ETF investor. So basically, what happens is that the ETF investor sells the Q shares to the authorized participant. The authorized participants take the ETF shares, redeem them for the underlying bonds, and then he decides what to do with these bonds, either to sell them on the market, which corresponds to gamma equal to zero, or to hold everything on the balance sheet, which corresponds to gamma equal to one, or to do something in between. So sell a fraction of the bonds and sell the other and put the other fraction on the balance sheet. So gamma is the fraction of bonds that the AP puts on his balance sheet. Um, so we assume that there's a perfect competition among the AP, so they compete to give the best possible price to the, to the redeeming ETF investor. So they want to choose gamma in such a way to maximize the ETF price given to the ETF investor. Um, so there are three types of costs. The first one is price impact costs. So if you sell redeemed bonds, then you depress their bond price, the, the price of those bonds, and that reduces your arbitrage profit. Um, and that's particularly true if there is a fire sale. So if you sell large quantities of bonds um, above a threshold tau, then you're going to face a huge price impact of F times X. Um, that's the first type of costs. Then there is holding costs. So if you put bonds on balance sheet, that's costly because it consumes balance sheet space. And remember, you put gamma fraction of the redeemed bonds and, um, and the ETF investor is, is selling Q shares. So gamma Q is how many bonds I put on my balance sheet. Um, and we assume that that's costly and you control for that cost by this parameter lambda. So lambda times gamma Q squared over two is the holding cost of putting gamma Q bonds on balance sheets. We assume this quadratic holding cost. Um, and then the third source of cost is mark to market costs. And that's the sense in which APs have skin in the game because they have initial inventory of, of bonds Z. And if they depress bond prices, they need to mark down that existing inventory and that hurts them. Um, and it creates that skin in the game incentive. Um, and then finally, the payoff for the AP consists of these three parts here. So the AP is, is, uh, is paying this price, P, to the redeeming ETF investor. He gets the NAV of the basket. So that's his arbitrage profit um, multiplied with the number of shares that the ETF investor is, is redeeming. Then he puts some bonds on balance sheet. So he has the holding cost, which is the, term, the second term here. And then finally, there are these mark to market costs. So I have initial inventory of Z. Then I put gamma Q in addition to that to my inventory. And I have to mark down everything by the change in the bond price of, of, of bond A, which is negative. So delta P is negative, And that's why this whole thing is a cost. Um, so that's the payoff of the AP in, in times of redemption. Um, I have a question, if I may. Yep. So suppose that I have a, a cross sec a data which has a cross section of authorized participants and a cross section of ETFs. Uh, would it be correct to say that the uh, the uh, ETF specific um, parameters here is uh, price impact uh, is is ETF specific. It's not specific to an authorized participant. Whereas lambda and uh, Z are specific to uh, authorized participants. So depending on what kind of inventory they hold and uh, uh, what what you know what 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 it costs them to hold additional inventory that would be sort of specific to them. Um, yes, absolutely correct. For for the AP, Lambda Z are AP specific. So different APs can, can have different holding costs, uh, Lambda and different initial inventory Z. Um, and we have an extension in the model that um, accounts for this heterogeneity of, of AP. So we have a case of multiple APs. The baseline model that I present um, here is, is in one of representative AP. So there is only one AP with one Lambda, one Z. Uh, as for the for the first part of the question, the C the C is bond specific. So basically, there are price impact costs that are bond specific instead of ETF specific. Um, Thank so that's you. that's basically the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. um, so let me move on to the creation case. So now the game is a big different. So Sorry, now can I just uh, we... just just if you go one one back? So I, I just try to understand what the key friction is that that makes your model work here is this the mark to market component because ultimately you know, the way you describe your model there is no fundamental impact on this on the bond right so if you could hold the bond yeah. to maturity 
then this there's then there's an arbitrage. It's the bond is essentially underpriced temporarily. Is that correct? Yes, yes, exactly. So the market market cost is the key friction here because of uh, initial inventory Z. The AP has this skin in the game, and that's the friction that drives this buffer function of the of the ETF. Absolutely correct. So, but how do you justify that? I mean, what's what's driving the need for mark to market? I mean, it mm -hmm. seems to be an imaginary. It's an, an imaginary loss. So maybe uh, uh, Anna yeah, yeah. can Anna can can comment on that. So I'll provide you some quotes by industry practitioners in 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 a couple of slides later uh, that basically justifies that that's indeed what's happening in practice. So. These APs, they care about the mark-to-market -market value of their existing inventory. And I'll, I'll show you the quote later, but basically one of the one of DTF market makers, what he says during the, um, the COVID-19 COVID March in March, COVID-19 stress in March 2020, what he said is that if the bonds don't trade, they don't, they don't, then you don't need to mark them down. So basically, it seems that uh, market, so these dealers could pretend that bond prices have not changed if there is no trade in this bond. Which means that they have they don't have to mark down the existing inventories. Um, I'm going to show you the quote. I think the, the, what the quote says is that you literally turn your chair away and you wait for the storm to pass. Basically, you don't mark down your existing inventories if the bond price is unchanged, and you pretend that nothing is happening. Um, sure, that's what the pension fund can do, right? Um, I, I'm just I'm mm -hmm. just trying to understand if if this just means that I mean, so, sorry, no, this is not a this is a general question of who's actually best able, therefore, to be. Uh, to mm -hmm. play the role of the authorized participant, it should be somebody who who actually doesn't have these costs, right? Who who doesn't have to account for them, who can, who doesn't have to mark to market. You mean of uh, who's the most competitive AP? Um, yeah, I mean the most competitive AP uh, would be one who doesn't have to do it, right? Or for whom yes. this this is the this is the lowest concern. Yes, for for redemption, that's correct. So if you have zero inventory, you have lower costs, so you can provide better price um, compared to an AP with some inventory. But then for creation is the opposite. Actually, the AP with the largest inventory is the one who can who is the most competitive. Um, and then given that these APs do creations and redemptions, um, and I'm going to show you in one of the hypotheses, we find this asymmetric response in creation and redemptions. So it, it seems that in reality, the marginal AP for redemptions and for creations is the one with some inventory. Um, because otherwise there will be segmentation in the market. So there is one AP doing all the redemptions with zero inventory. There's going to be one AP doing all the creations with some inventory. Um, but then we wouldn't find this asymmetry that we find in the data within uh, creations and redemptions that I'm going to show you later on. Okay. All right. Sorry, I should yeah. shut up. Those are all good points. Very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, so let me go to the creation case. So now basically the setup is a bit different because the AP faces buying pressure. So people want to buy ETF shares. So the AP needs to go and buy the underlying bonds on the bond market. Um, and now the choice of the AP is what fraction of the bonds to take from the balance sheet. So I have some bonds on my balance sheet. I could take those bonds and create ETF shares, or I can just go and buy the bonds to the bond market and use those new newly purchased bonds to create ETF shares. So now the, the choice is what fraction gamma of the bonds to take from my own balance sheet to, to create uh, ETF shares. And um, the goal is to minimize the ETF price because now ETF investors are buying. Um, so again, their pricing bet costs, and for simplicity, we don't model fire purchases because those are less interesting in practice. What we care about in terms of stress is fire sales, but it's easy to model fire purchases as well in the model. Um, now there are costs from deviating from the inventory. So basically, if I deviate from my target inventory, I still have this quadratic cost. We have an extension in the in the, in the paper that um, relax this assumption here. And then the third um, type of cost for redemption is now actually a gain. So now we have mark-to-market gains because if I buy bonds on the bond market, I'm able to mark up my existing inventory. And that's actually good for me because now the mark to market value of my existing bonds is higher because I can boost bond prices um, by creating ETF shares. And that's crucial asymmetry between creations and redemptions. Um, and again, the, the payoff of the AP is the arbitrage profit. So the difference between the ETF price and the net asset value of the underlying, um, uh, underlying creation basket times the number of ETF shares created. Now I have this cost from deviating from the inventory the second term, and then I have mark to market gains. So I have my initial inventory of Z. I use gamma Q to create ETF shares. So my inventory goes down and then I can mark everything up by the change in the bond price A, which now is positive. So crucially, the difference between redemptions and creation is that the third term is now positive. So it's good for me to boost bond prices. Whereas for redemptions, remember this third term was negative because the change in the bond price is, is negative. So it's a cost for me. And that's creates this source of asymmetry between creation and redemptions. Um, there is a question, I think, by Andre. Yeah, to follow to follow up, I think a bit on on Andrea's question and my question as well is, uh, uh, 
uh, I think you're making an assumption. It's a simplifying assumption, and it's not unfair in a baseline model to make an assumption that, uh, and I think you're making it, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, mm -hmm. the each AP is, is sort of intermediating between the underlying market for bonds and the sponsor. Uh, but there is no intermediation chain that involves, say, multiple APs with each other, because one way in which uh, in which uh, sort of competition, what what the competition there could lead to, it could be sort of a one AP could self-select to basically become a uh, uh, a dealer for their other IPs in the time of uh, redemption. So creation, you know, you're kind of on your own. But redemption, you can just dump them onto uh, one authorized participant who has other times, you know, at other times zero sort of inventory, and therefore becomes most competitive at the time of a uh, of redemption. Am I am, is is that making sense? Um, so what, what we assume in, the, in this model is that there is one big AP representative AP. Um, so. Uh, Potentially, that that could be happening in practice. That you have this intermediation chain that the AP gets the bond, but then he sells it to another to another dealer. Um, but what is important for our model is that uh, there is at least one AP uh, that does the redemption and it has some inventory. And in that case, the buffer function of the AP goes through. Um, if it's an intermediation chain, or you just aggregate all these intermediate APs into one big representative AP, I don't think it makes big difference in terms of the model. What could be different is that uh, there might be some strategic um, interactions arising if you have this intermediation chain. For example, you can have small inventory in the redeemed bonds, whereas another AP can have big inventory in those bonds, and then you might be able to to act strategically um, if you want to if you if you want to be competitive to that AP and uh, potentially front run um, the sales of those bonds. But we don't we don't model this. Um, um, these strategic interactions within the model. We just assume one representative AP, and then we have an extension where we look at multiple APs, but without strategic um, interactions, without AP chains, intermediary chains in, in the model. It um, might be fair, I think, to, to sort of acknowledge this point. Um, so what is important for our mechanism is that at least one of the APs in this intermediation chain has a, has a positive inventory. Um, and uh, so over the long run, if 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 the AP, if the marginal AP for redemptions have always has always zero inventory, then we would see that the gamma, so the fraction of bonds that are um, held on the uh, on the on the balance sheet of the in, you know, the marginal AP is zero. And then we find the same thing for creations that gamma is zero, which means that there should be no no asymmetry between creation and redemption bonds. Um, and in practice, we find strong asymmetry between those two, which is evidence that the redemption AP, the marginal AP for redemptions has some inventory. Um, it could be because of intermediation chain or because we you just be one AP who does all the redemptions with some inventory. But what is important for our mechanism is that there is at least some inventory of those redeemed, of those redeemed bonds on the marginal AP's balance sheet. And we find evidence for that in practice through our hypothesis one that I'm going to go over later. I'm not sure about that. I mean, it may, may well be true, but I think, you know, I to me, it would be fair to say, look, you know, this is the model. It's a baseline model. This is what we're assuming. And there might be other interactions because to me, uh, as you call them, strategic interactions or network effects could lead to amplification rather than sort of damping in. But you can just say, look, that is not mm -hmm. what we're modeling. And that, that would kind of be fair. Um, yeah. Let me go with this hypothesis one in the empirical section. Then I can pause for questions if you, if you, if you think that... Um... There might be some strategic complementarization involved in the um, um, that that could lead to the empirical patterns of defining the data because we find this strong asymmetry and for us that's that's uh, evidence that the marginal P for redemptions has some inventory but um, maybe after I cover those results we can we can raise these points again. I, yeah. I could just tell you that I've looked at some data with so with uh, I API like IDs and uh, they are chains. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, it's an interesting point. I guess we can we can think about it more in terms of uh, what could be the implication for the model. But from what from what I see now, indeed, if there is at least one AP who is acting as margin with some inventory, everything goes through. But um, we can acknowledge this point. It's a good point. Just good. Just you can carry on. It's all good. Yep. Okay. 
Um, so then we solve the model for the case of redemption and the case of creation. And the way to solve the model is basically assume that the marginal IP makes zero profit in equilibrium because there's perfect competition. Then we set um, the, the profit of the IP to the payoff of the IP to zero, and then we solve for the ETF. Um, so, so we maximize the ETF price in case of redemptions or we minimize it in case of creations. And then you find what is the optimal gamma. So for redemptions, for certain parameter values, so for the holding cost being more than two times the price impact cost in the typical redemption case, and for um, uh, inventory that, that is not too large, there is an intermediary solution. So basically between zero and one for gamma. Um, and the solution is that in normal case, when the, when the amount of bonds sold is less than the threshold tau, the, the fire cell threshold tau, then the gamma that the AP chooses is this quantity here. And intuitively, it's increasing in the inventory. So if you have more inventory, you have more skin in the game, and you're going to put more bonds on your balance sheet because you don't want to depress bond prices and uh, have to mark your existing inventory down. It's uh, also increasing in the... Um, sorry, it's decreasing in the holding cost. So if it's cheaper to hold bonds, you're going to put more bonds on your balance sheet. Um, and basically, it's it's increasing in Z over Q, which captures the trade-off that you have large inventory compared to the redemption amount. You're going to put more bonds on your balance sheet. Um, so that's what happens in normal cases. Now, if there is a fire sale case, so in, in meaning that I need to sell, sell more bonds above the threshold tau, so which is the second line here, then what Dave is going to do, he's going to sell up to the threshold tau to avoid the jump in price impact cost from C to F and put everything else on the balance sheet. So basically, I sell uh, the amount of bonds equal to tau. I stay on the price impact curve that gives me an um, price impact cost of C, and then I put everything else on my balance sheet. I'm going to show you uh, the graph on the next slide. Um, and what is important here is that because gamma tau is larger than gamma C, the AP inefficiently holds too many bonds on his balance sheet to prevent fire sales. Um, so there are two there are two other cases in the model when the inventory when the holding costs are too small, um, and when the inventory of the AP is very high. In those cases, the we have a corner solution that gamma is equal to one, so the AP holds all the bonds on the balance sheet. Um, so let me again illustrate what's happening in times of fire sales relative to normal times. So the blue curve here depicts the price of the ETF as a function of gamma. So gamma is on the x-axis and the ETF price is on the y-axis. And normally we have this blue curve here. Um, so gamma, gamma star C is this, is this quantity that you see here. So what happens in times of fire sales is that if I choose gamma star C, I'm going to face price impact costs of F. So I'm going to be on the red curve, which is the fire sale curve. And having this price here is less than having the price at the blue curve, which corresponds to normal price impact, yeah, normal price impact case, if I choose gamma star tau. So basically I choose the gamma star tau, meaning that I sell up to the threshold tau and I put everything else on my balance sheet. So the optimal choice of gamma is here, but instead I choose gamma star tau because I want to stay on the blue price impact cost curve to avoid the discontinuous jump in fire cell cost in price impact cost from C to F and to avoid the jump from the blue curve to the red curve. So in fire cells, basically the price as a function of gamma is this discontinuous blue red curve uh, that is highlighted on this graph. And that's why the optimal solution is I, I sell the kink here um, and I put this amount of bonds on my balance sheet, which is much larger than the optimal amount that I should put gamma star C. Um, all right. So a couple of uh, insights from this from this equilibrium. So basically, we show that no matter what how large the redemption amount of bond the redemption amount of ETF shares Q is, the AP always avoids the fire sales. So he always puts enough bonds on his balance sheet in order to avoid the jump in price impact cost from C to F. So the jump from the blue to the red curve, um, and that basically means that the AP holds inefficiently more bonds on his balance sheet, which of course is costly because uh, putting bonds on balance sheet, especially in times of stress, is costly. So who is paying for that cost is the redeeming ETF investors because they pay this huge discount. They sell the ETF, their ETF shares at a very low price compared to the net asset value from the line holdings. And that difference, the discount, is the, is, the, is, the, is the profit that the AP generates in order to be compensated for holding bonds on balance sheet. So if you remember the payoff of the AP in times of redemptions, is this line here. Um, and the profit of the AP, the, the first term here, is very closely linked to the discount. Um, so if I have, have a lot of holding costs because I put too many bonds on my balance sheet, I need to be compensated by having larger arbitrage profit, which means larger discount, larger difference between the NAV and the ETF price. And that's exactly what's happening in the equilibrium in, in our model. So if you have to put too many bonds on your balance sheet, you charge very low price, um, um, you give very low price to the redeeming ETF investors. In other words, they pay a huge discount 
um, to get immediate liquidity. Another insight of the model is that um, it does the AP does not minimize the discount when when uh, doing redemptions, which is somewhat um, different from the standard ETF textbook arbitrage case, in which usually we think that the AP minimizes discount or minimizes the premium. What our model highlights is that with frictions, with holding costs and pricing by cost, the AP does not necessarily minimize the ETF discount when maximize the when maximize the ETF price in terms of redemptions. Um, so there was this question about whether mark to market costs are something artificial or something that's going on in practice. So here we put this quote by the leading one of the ETF market making firms, GHCO. Um, it's it's an article by the FT, and what the what the chief executive basically said is that if the bonds don't trade, then you don't have to write them down. So uh, market makers have this incentive to not decrease the mark to market value of their existing inventories by by basically keeping bond prices stale or by keeping the change in the bond price very low because then they don't have to they don't have to write them down. They don't have to mark down the existing inventory. So that's indeed something that is happening in practice according to that FT article. Um, so that's the case of redemptions. Now, if you look at the creation equilibrium, the equilibrium is much simpler. Instead of having several cases for gamma, gamma is always zero, meaning that the AP always buys all the bonds on the uh, on the on the bond market instead of taking them from the balance sheet. So even if I have the bonds that I needed to create ETF shares on my balance sheet, I'm never going to do that. I always go to the bond market, I buy these bonds, and I deliver them to create ETF shares. Um, and why is that the case? Well, because I can increase the mark to market value of my existing inventory. So it's always good to buy bonds on the market, to push up their prices and mark up my existing inventory. Um, and that's always beneficial for me. That's why I always choose gamma equal to zero. And again, so we highlight that DAP does not minimize the ETF premium, which is again different compared to the classical uh, textbook ETF arbitrage case, where DAP where the is minimizing the premium and minimizing the discount in terms of um, premiums or discounts. Um, um, so let me uh, provide you this. Um, let me give you the insight about the comparison of ETFs to mutual funds and why ETFs might be better suited in managing liquid assets than mutual funds. Um, so we model stylized mutual fund in the model um, as an ETF that has full baskets. So holdings are equivalent to baskets because there is no AP and then there is no flexibility of choosing different uh, bonds in, um, compared to ETFs. Um, there is no IP and that's why the inventory is zero. And then the gamma of creation is equal to gamma of redemption is equal to zero because there is nobody in between the mutual fund manager and the redeeming mutual fund investor. So there is no IP like with ETFs. And that's why gamma is always equal to zero for mutual funds. Um, so what that highlights is that the ETFs are very similar to mutual funds for creations because the gamma is zero for ETFs and for mutual funds. So whenever there is a buying pressure of $100, the, a, the ETF and the mutual fund, they both go on the market and they buy $100 of bonds to deliver and create new shares. But when it comes to redemptions, the ETFs are very different from mutual funds because the ETF only transmits part of the selling pressure to the market. So if there's $100 of redemptions, the, the ETF only transmits part of this $100 to the bond market, whereas the mutual fund transmits it in full. So $100 of selling in, 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 in uh, corporate bonds. Um, so in that case, basically, mutual funds cannot avoid fire sales because there is no buffer, there's no IP to to hold on these bonds and put them on balance sheet and prevent the transmission of the selling pressure. Um, and that's why in some sense, um, mutual funds actually act on behalf of selling investors because they, they need to raise cash and give to their redeeming investors. And usually they do so by selling more liquid assets first, meaning that if you're remaining ETF invest, uh, if you're remaining mutual fund investor, you have an incentive to run because you're, you're left with lower quality of bonds um, after the mutual fund sells the most liquid part of the portfolio first. With ETF actually is different because the AP acts on the behalf of remaining investors because the AP has skin in the game. He always has bonds. He also has bonds on his balance sheet. And that's why the remaining investors are, are, are better protected in an, in an ETF structure, whereas the selling investors, the ones who demand immediate liquidity, are the ones that suffer because they pay this huge discount if they want to run for the exit now. So in that sense, ETFs are actually better suited at managing liquid assets because they don't have these run incentives. Um, which is very different to what uh, mutual funds have. Um, so let me pause here if there are any questions about the equilibrium and the comparison to mutual funds. Yeah, I want to come back to my earlier question, right? Where basically, I mean, one of the key frictions that you have is that you, as a as a AP, you have to mark to market. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, the way, I mean, so as, as you describe it here, right? So as a mutual fund, you basically just sold the one-to-one, -one, right? So any asset that you that you issue, any any mutual fund unit that you issue is fully backed by the assets, but no more than that. 
And it seems like for the for the ETFs, there is a liquidity advantage for the provider of the for the AP, right? So because it's better for them to hold them in the inventory rather than buying them on the open market because you know they can provide liquidity cheaper. I, I think that's the argument. But isn't it that mm -hmm. the the mark to market constraint that you put in is is kind of countering that? Um, because it seems to be, you know, that that seems to be exactly the the kind of friction that the the ETF provider wants to uh, is is meant to avoid uh, at least conceptually. Um. So you mean basically uh, it would be optimal to have an AP with zero inventory in ETFs to avoid the friction of having to mark well, down? It's, well, it's more like the, so the mark to market cost that you have is artificial in the sense of, because, you know, again, if you hold a bond to maturity, then you don't have a loss, right? Um, mm -hmm. So because the, the price impact is temporary because of selling pressure. It's not temporary because of fundamentals. Yes. Um, and so... So I, what I'm trying to say is when you have an illiquid market, then that's precisely, you, you precisely seem to hold the bonds in your inventory because you don't have to, you don't have to face that cost, right? So you can provide them cheaper from your inventory than you have to do it if, by buying them in the open market. Well, that's, yeah, indeed, that's one comparative advantage of APs with inventories compared to, compared to those with, without inventory. And another, another reason why you would want to have bonds on in your inventory is because sometimes um, it's hard to find these bonds. So sometimes the bonds that are part of the ETF benchmark are hard to find. So it's so it's better if you have them at hand at your existing inventory. You can provide these bonds faster and cheaper compared to an AP with zero inventory who has to find somebody who has the bonds. Um, and that's why that's one reason why APs for corporate bonds are very different from APs that act in the equity market. Because in equities, the underlying asset is much more liquid. We don't have these minimum trading amounts, which for bonds are often on the size of one million, um, and and it's much easier to arbitrage differences in equity markets in some sense because you don't have to hold these stocks; they're very liquid. You can find them always. With corporate bonds, um, it's, it's generally much harder to find all the bonds that are part of the ETF benchmark if you're not a specialized uh, bond investor in, the, in that space. So if you're, that's why if you have an inventory in those bonds, and then it's easier to grab that bonds and deliver them for creation. Or if you're able to hold them in, in case of redemption, you have a comparative advantage compared to somebody who has no inventory and, and for whom it's harder to find um, the underlying bonds. And I think that's one of the reasons why in corporate bond ETFs, we have this APs who are also bond dealers because it's just it's just more efficient to have APs um, that are also bond dealers in that space because it's much easier for them to do the arbitrage. They have this comparative advantage of being both dealers and APs. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Man, it's an, it's another liquidity story in a way, right? But I, I don't yeah. want to hog the conversation, so um, maybe passing it mm -hmm. on to, to Peter. Yeah, Peter Lana, you have raised your hand. Uh, what is the difference between uh, your model and model of Pan and uh, Zhang, uh, which you uh, described uh, in the beginning? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think in the Pan and Zeng model, basically what they highlight is this distortion of incentives if you have inventory, meaning that uh, sometimes you might want to use some bonds from your inventory to create ETF shares. Um, basically, you use the ETF as a way to manage your inventory. So you, you want to get rid of certain bonds and that's why you package them in a creation basket and deliver them to the ETF sponsor. Um, and sometimes you want to get some bonds that are, that are demanded by a client. That's why you redeem them from the ETF sponsor. So they focus on that role of inventory. What we and um, they have seen, they have been some um, um, opposing evidence whether that trend is actually happening in practice. So what we've highlighted in our model is that the inventory can actually be a skin in the game. So instead of being something bad in some sense that APs that can distort it, APs incentives because they have this inventory, so they want to manage it, and and that creates a distortion of interest um, um, uh, in the role as APs. In our case, we highlight that inventory is actually good because it creates uh, the skin in the game and the APs are incentivized to prevent the transmission of fire cells um, to the bond market because of this inventory. So inventory is, in some sense, is good in our model because it creates this buffer uh, for the ETF. So that's yes, the difference. But uh, setup is almost identical or there is a difference in setup? There is a, yeah, there's a difference in setup because we have this mark-to-market cost and mark-to-market gains. Um, there's something that is missing from their model. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think we should uh, let you continue. So, because you know we're almost at time. Oh yeah. Okay. 
let me just speed up. So in terms of data, we use ETF Global for data on ETFs, market for data on corporate bonds. And um, we also use the trading volume from Trace, bond inventory data from the Fed, um, from the New York Fed. And we focus on the, um, the period from May 2017 to February 2020 as the normal case. And then we analyze the March 2020 stress episode in a, in a separate um, subcase in the paper. And we have around 90 ETFs in total, and we focus on ETFs that have uh, more than 90% of holding in corporate bonds. Um, so let me go to the four hypotheses that we test in the data and then the empirical results of these four hypotheses. So as a first hypothesis, we postulate that there is this inherent asymmetry between creation and redemption because our model says when there is a creation, the AP goes and buys all the bonds. So gamma is zero, uh, as you remember from the equilibrium. Um, but when there is a redemption, the AP only sells a fraction of the bonds. So gamma is between zero and one. And that's why our model says that there's this asymmetry between creation and redemptions. So if you regret the trading volume of bonds, um, so bond I need FE at time T um, on the predicted creation volume, which is basically the flow of the ETF E at time T times the weight of that bond, of that bond in the creation basket for, for the ETF. So basically that's a dollar amount of trading in bond I in held by ETF E at time T. Um, and we do the same thing for redemptions. So when we regress the, the trading volume observed in trace on the prediction from creation and prediction of redemption, what we need, what we should find according to our model is that beta should be close to one because the AP just buys and transmits one to one the selling pressure, uh, sorry, the buying pressure um, from the ETF to the underlying corporate bond market. So that's why beta should be close to one. Whereas in times of redemption, the AP transmits only part of the selling pressure. So eta should be between zero and one. And also this regression estimates give us a sense of what is gamma creation, gamma redemption, because one minus beta is gamma creation and one minus eta is gamma redemption. So remember gamma is what I put on my balance sheet. One minus gamma is what, is what I trade. Um, so we run these two regressions and we include bond fixed effects and ETF time fixed effects as controls. And we find that indeed empirically in the data, especially if you look at the second column here, beta is very close to one. Um, and eta is between zero and one. So empirically, we find that eta is, is 0.15, meaning that basically if there is $100 of redemption, um, APs hold $85 on balance sheet and they only sell $15 um, to, to, the, to, the, to the bond market. So they basically hold quite a big a fraction of the bonds on, on the same day on their balance sheet. Whereas with creations, indeed, we find this huge asymmetry that, uh, that gamma creation is close to one, sorry, gamma, gamma creation close to zero or beta is close to one meaning that the APs transmit one-to-one -one the bank pressure, but they, they transmit less than one-to-one -one the selling pressure, which is consistent with the, with the prediction from our model. Um, so that's basically the first hypothesis that we run. The second one is that our model highlights inventories are driving force for premiums and discounts. And um, the prediction is that if you have large discount, you have, oh, sorry, if you have large inventory, you have a lot of skin in the game, meaning that the um, you have higher costs of preventing uh, fire sales or generally higher cost of putting bonds on balance sheet. And that's why you demand larger arbitrage profit, which means larger discount. That's what happens in terms of redemptions. In terms of creations, <clears throat> if you have larger inventory, you have more mark to market gains. So you're able to accept even small arbitrage profit and sometimes even negative arbitrage profit, which means that you, you re your rate accept a lower premium. So greater inventory means larger discounts or smaller premiums because premiums are the negatives of the discount. So we run those two regressions. So discounts on inventories um, after controlling for ETF flows or beta spread of the ETF and then for the fraction of bonds that are put in the basket. Um, and the prediction that we have is that discounts are increasing in inventories. So beta one RD should be positive, whereas premiums, which are the negatives of discounts should be decreasing in inventory. So beta one creation should be less than zero. That's the prediction from, from the model. Um, Again, we run these two regressions and we find indeed that for, for discounts, the columns one and two, this coefficient is positive um, and strongly statistically significant, meaning that if you have larger inventory, you have larger discounts. And same thing for creations. So columns three and four, we find that this coefficient is strongly negatively significant, um, meaning that if you have larger inventory, you, you, you have smaller premiums of ETFs. Um, so that's hypothesis number two that we test in the data. Um, and then the third hypothesis is related to the second one, meaning uh, which, as you remember, is basically larger inventory means more skin in the game, means larger discounts in terms of redemptions or smaller premiums in terms of creations. And that's particularly true in terms of fire sales, because remember, in terms of fire sales, the ETF has to, has to avoid the transmission of the selling pressure. So he needs to put too many bonds on balance sheet. 
um, and mean, meaning that he has two large holding costs, and which means that in terms of fire sales, we should see particular large discounts for for um, bonds that are held a lot by authorized participants. Um, and as I'm going to show you on the next slide, if you look at inventories of um, dealers in U.S. corporate bonds, they have very large inventories in investment grade bonds, especially for short maturity bonds. So Z is very large if you look at investment grade short maturity bonds, whereas Z is very close to zero if you look at, if you look at high yield bonds. So our model, quite counterintuitively, actually predicts that if you have a fire sale, the APs have a lot of skin in the game in investment grade bonds, so they're going to demand large arbitrage profit, meaning larger discounts in investment grade bonds compared to high yield bonds. And that's a bit counterintuitive because the, the typical story for why we observe price and why we observe premiums and discounts is that DTF prices are faster to react. So there's price discovery happening in the DTF market. ETF prices jump and then NAV is, is catching up. Um, and basically price discovery happens in the ETF market. What our what our um, what our model says is the price discovery happens in the um, sorry that the, there is no price discovery, everything is price temporary price impact. And that's why what happened, what matters is the level of inventory. So our model says, if you have large inventory investment grade bonds, you should see larger discounts in investment grade bonds. The alternative story is that because bond prices are stale, you need to see, you're going to see larger discounts in less liquid bonds, high yield bonds. So those, those basically are two opposite predictions from um, the existing ETF theories based on illiquidity, meaning that if you have less liquid bonds, like high yield bonds, you need, uh, you're going to observe larger discounts. Our model says exactly the opposite. Because you have larger inventory investment rate bonds, you're going to see larger discounts for investment rate bonds. Um, I'm just going to just let me show you the the inventory in investment rate and high yield bonds how it looks like in the data. So here we plot the um, the distribution of inventories over time in four categories of bonds: high yield long, the blue bars; high yield short, the orange ones; and then investment rate long in green and investment rate short in red. And you see, on average. Um, APs hold close to zero inventory in high yield long bonds. So the, 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 the mean of the distribution for the blue bars is close to zero, whereas they have pretty large inventory in investment grade long terms and short term bonds. So the green and the, and the red bars here, which means that APs or, or bond dealers have more skin in the game in investment grade bonds. And that's why you, in terms of fire sales, we expect to see larger discounts for investment grade bonds um, compared to high yield bonds because of this inventory channel that we highlight in the model. So let me pause here for questions. Yeah, so um, we all definitely want to hear Anand's uh, opinion. So, okay. um, no, this super presentation. Thank you. Uh, um, just a comment about the premiums and discounts, especially when we get to the March uh, of 2020 results, which is, um, you know, uh, there's staleness in, in the uh, prices of the bonds, of course, and that translates into what we'll call latency in NAV. So, in this period, the NAVs are actually struck at 3 p.m., not at 4 p.m. Uh, they've changed that since then, but the processing times are so slow that it actually take 3 p.m. prices to strike the, the end-of-day NAVs. Um, obviously, the NAVs were reflecting uh, transactions that might have been a week ago, 10 days ago, things like that. So the NAVs are actually quite stale, which may be a factor in interpreting the results. So the premiums and discounts aren't actionable. So to the earlier question about uh, is the nav a fair value in the model it is but in in the data it's it's the it's the stated nav so there there's there's a discrepancy there which might explain what's going on i think the other thing that's worth considering when we look at this chart is that the dealers are going to hold as inventory the most liquid bonds i mean that's that's how they they are trading and so it shouldn't be surprising that they hold these more these investment grade bonds uh as a as a result uh, I think the last point I want to make is that, you know, the model frames things um, from the viewpoint of the authorized participant. Keep in mind that on the other side of the thing, um, iShares, Vanguard, and so on, must decide what is acceptable uh, or not, right? And so we have always that control, and and we will always want to make sure that we're not getting, um, you know, a bad basket of bonds. So th those are just some general comments. Mm -hmm. Um. Thanks a lot for the comment. So indeed, basically, so what um, what the typical story is about discounts and, and premiums, especially during the COVID stress, is that NAV is stale. So as Anand raised um, a very good points, basically NAV could be even snapped at a different point in time. Instead of 4 p.m., where the ETF prices, when the ETF price is recorded, they could be snapped at 3 p.m., which could create a discount. And that's 
presuming that the problem for uh, the problem for less liquid assets like high yield bonds is even is 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 even stronger than the problem for more liquid assets like investment grade bonds. So basically, this staleness of NAV would predict that less liquid assets like high yield bonds they should trade at larger discounts compared to investment grade bonds because for them the 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 update the update of price is even is even less frequent than for uh, more more liquid investment grade bonds. So basically, this type of staleness of NAV hypothesis will predict that high yield bonds will have lower sorry, higher discounts compared to investment grade bonds because their prices are more stale. So they're not updated that often as high yield, as, as investment grade bonds. Um, so if you look at what happened during COVID, so on the first chart, we show you the price dynamics. So this is ETF price on the y-axis and then time on the on the x-axis. And as you see, there is nothing surprising here. So high yield bonds, they're riskier, they're less liquid. So they drop more in price. So the blue and the orange lines, they're below the red and the green lines um, just because high yield is more risk and less liquid and the price dropped by more. For, for high yield compared to investment rate bonds. But when you look at discounts, it's actually the opposite picture. So if you look at the discount for high yield uh, bonds, the blue and the orange lines here, which are again, more stale typically because they're less liquid, the discounts for these types of bonds is much smaller compared to the discount for investment rate bonds, which are presumably less stale. So the price of these bonds are more frequent, they are safer, and yet they were trading at larger discounts. So that's the puzzling dynamics that we see in, in, in COVID which is hard to explain with this um, illiquidity story based on stale, uh, staleness of NAV, because then you would expect that high yield bonds would, would trade a larger discount compared to investment rate bonds. So what our model highlights is that we, we, we don't have to only look at liquidity, we also have to look at inventories. And because as I showed you in the um, two, two slides before, the inventory in the investment rate is pretty large compared to the inventory in high yield bonds. APs have a lot of skin in the game in investment rate bonds, so they, they're going to demand a large arbitrage profit. So in other words, larger discount to compensate them for putting bonds on balance sheet in investment rate bonds compared to high yield bonds. Um, and in that sense, our model basically predicts that you should that you should see high yield, higher discounts for investment rate bonds compared to high yield bonds in times of stress because APs just have more skin in the game. And that's exactly what you see during the COVID, the COVID stress. Um, so that's basically the evidence in favor of this hypothesis number three that we um, that we develop in the paper. Here is just another quote by the same ETF market making firm, which basically again um, confirms this uh, intuition that we have in the paper that um, basically what happens during times of stress is, as, as, as this guy says, everyone just turns to their chair, looks away, and says, we, we wait it out. So basically, you don't have to mark down your existing inventory, you don't have to. Um, um, you don't have to suffer a, a, a paper loss because of marking down if the bonds don't trade. So if you just don't update the prices, if you don't mark them down, you don't have to suffer this mark-to-market loss. So indeed, this mark-to-market costs and gains that we have in the model are something that practitioners cares about, care about based on this quote um, from the FT and based on anecdotal evidence. Um, let me go to the last hypothesis that we have in the paper and then conclude uh, pretty fast. Um, the last hypothesis is this um, price discovery story. So um, what our model says is that there is price, temporary price impact in ETFs. So premiums and discounts just rise because there is temporary price impact. There's nothing about price discovery. And the way to test this hypothesis is we run returns of ETFs and NAV in the next five days on the premium today. Um, and we have those two coefficients of interest, beta ETF and beta NAV. So we control for ETF fixed effects or time fixed effects. Um, and then for um, uh, return on DTF and return of NAV. And the prediction from our model is that what happens is when you see premium, so for example, in uh, when pi is, uh, is positive, the ETF price goes up. So basically the ETF price goes up, we see a premium. And then what's going to happen over the next days, the ETF price is going to revert. So NAV is not going to move, ETF price is going to revert. That's the story in our model. So beta ETF should be negative basically, and beta NAV should be close to zero. An alternative story, which is the price discovery story is that ETF price jumps here, we see a premium. What's going to happen is the ETF price is going to stay here over the next five days. NAV is going to slowly catch up because price discovery happens in the ETF market. NAV is then slowly catching up. And the prediction of that alternative story is that beta ETF is close to zero. So the ETF price doesn't move. That's where the price discovery is. Whereas NAV is going to catch up and beta NAV is positive. So we run those two regressions for the subset of our ETFs and, and our sample. And what we find is that, so, so basically what we find in that is that um, beta ETF is negative, statistically significant, meaning that there is a reversal in ETF prices, consistent with temporary price impact, both for premiums and both and for discounts, so columns one and three. And NAV is indeed, beta NAV is close to zero. So NAV doesn't catch up over the next five days, uh, meaning that um, it seems that what we see um, in the sample of, um, of ETFs that we have in the paper 
is that there is no evidence of price discovery in the ETF in time in times when we see a positive premiums or or or, or negative premiums um, discounts. Everything is temporary. So the ETF price is just overreacting. They revert over the next five days. NAV does not move, and that's consistent with the model prediction that it's about temporary price impact rather than price discovery. Um, so let me conclude here. So we we developed this very simple model to understand how shocks are transmitted from the ETF market to the illiquid corporate bond market. And we highlight that TTFs are good in the sense that they have this inherent buffer that can prevent the transmission of fire cells from the um, liquid ETF market to the liquid corporate bond market. And then there is this inherent asymmetry. So the, the authorized participant behaves in a very different way for creations compared to redemptions. So for creations, he transmits one-to-one -one the buying pressure, 100% of the, of the creation amount. Whereas for redemptions, he transmits only 15% of the, of the selling pressure to the underlying bond market because he puts 80%, 85% of the redemption basket on his balance sheet. Um, so we find some empirical support for the model. And uh, in terms of implications, so we show that ETFs in some sense are better suited in managing liquid assets compared to other investment vehicles like mutual funds because of this inherent buffer. Um, and um, in that sense, APs actually act on the behalf of remaining ETF investors. So their incentives are aligned with, with uh, remaining ETF investors, whereas for mutual funds, in some sense, the, um, their incentives are, are aligned with the redeeming ETF investors, which create all these kind of problems re uh, re related to run behavior. ETFs mitigate those problems. And that's because we have this in-kind transfers, which allows the, the AP to act as a buffer and avoid the transmission of, of shocks from the ETF market to the, to the bond market without affecting the mark-to-market -market value of existing inventory because everything is in-kind. With mutual funds, they need to sell the bond on the market, raise cash and give to investors. With, with ETFs, everything is in-kind, which allows for this buffer function of, of, the, of the ETF. In terms of support, um, in, terms, in terms of policy, so what could be the, what would be the perfect AP? It will be a, an AP that basically can weather in the storm. It can put bonds on balance sheet. So if we make it easier for APs to put bonds on balance sheet, so if we decrease their holding costs, um, that's going to support the bond market and the corporate bond market and the ETF market in the sense that redeeming ETF investors are going to face lower discounts because it's cheaper for the APs to put bonds on balance sheet. Um, and APs are going, to, are going to do this buffer function and prevent the transmission of fire cells. Um, so thanks a lot for your attention. And let me uh, stop here and hear the remaining questions. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I actually want to pose a question quickly to Anand uh, because he mentioned that the that the NAS could be stale and the like. Is there a way for uh, for them to to correct for this? Uh, do you have a suggestion for that? Yeah, um, great, great question. Um, so what we've done is we did a bottoms up um, uh, tool to do fifteen second intraday valuation. So essentially, we uh, model each bond's um, yield curve using 11 key rate durations. We add in a credit spread factor. So it's a 12 factor model bond specific. We cover about 40,000 bonds and um, the, you know, the secret sauce isn't the yield curve or the 12 factors. The secret sauce is we are getting dealer runs in, you know, every minute from, from all over the world. And we also have the trace print so we can say, okay, this was an actionable price at 11 o'clock. Now it's one o'clock. Uh, what do we think the yield curve movements and the credit spread movements would mean for this bond? Then you go bottoms up, you add in the accrued interest, the cash in the fund, uh, and you come up with an intraday valuation. I'm sure that the market makers have even more advanced models. I know some of our guys are experimenting with uh, machine learning AI to, to track patterns among related bonds and expand that model. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of one way to mitigate this effect of staleness. I will just say that a very simple test, and maybe it's a question for Karamphil, which is when when Alex Sobchik and I did this work, we we found that there was consistent with an efficient market hypothesis, there was very little autocorrelation in uh, ETF price returns. That's understandable. So, you know, you have 80, 100,000 transactions a day in the ETF and maybe 25 in the top bonds right in this period of crisis. I think we have the stats on that in one of our papers. So you see a strong uh, autocorrelation in NAV returns, but almost zero autocorrelation in ETF returns, which is, I'm just curious in, in the test whether you found that um, as well, Karim Phil. Um, from, what I uh, from what I remember, there was some evidence of negative autocorrelation in, 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 uh, in ETF returns actually. So it might be just the sample that we're using is a bit different from what you used in the paper with, uh, with, uh, with Sobchuk. Um, so what we, theoretically both stories could be true. So there be could some price discovery happening 
and there could be some reversal. So um, the world, the world is not. Really yeah, black. I mean, the, the bid offer spreads are really wide, so that might account for the negative autocorrelation. So, like Dick Roll yeah. had a paper on this a long time ago, and so uh, that, that might true, yeah. that might drive it. Um, but you will see that actually the 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 NAV returns are very predictable, <laughs> and the and the price returns are not. So it's it, it, there's clearly something that's you know NAV is just. Uh, is typically stale. And, and getting back to your comments about investment grade and high yield, I think part of the part of what might be going on is the high yield market just locked up. There was no liquidity, so the prices couldn't adjust. Whereas the the investment grade was, you know, sort of liquid, and so the prices could move. So you would you might see that pattern of premiums and discounts reflecting what was actually trading. So. Yeah, if that was the case, we would see even larger discount for high yield. Because remember, like if, if the market is freezing and if it doesn't move, but the ETF market is moving, we're going to see this huge discount. Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. If, if the if the bond stopped trading, let's say the bonds are at hundred and the bonds stop trading, uh, you don't see you don't see them trading at eighty. So you know you won't see premiums and discounts. You just see it looking kind of flat, which is what you have in your chart. So it could be liquidity, right? We just don't know. So. Topic for future research. All right. Um, I mean, we have an, an, another few minutes. I think um, we we normally go until what twelve fifteen. But um, so, if there's any other questions, I would like to invite them now. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah, one question. Sorry, I can't raise my hand. Um, hi, Karen. For um. Hey, one thing, I mean, if, if you compare high yield to investment grade, a priori, I would think that your model would sort of push more into a piece holding more high yield to minimize price impact. So I guess your interpretation is it's mostly the inventory costs are very high for high yield. So that's why they don't do it. Um, so that's one of the reasons I think Anand also raised a um, very good point is basically it's cheaper for them to hold investment grade bonds indeed because of balance sheet constraints. Um, um then holding high yield bonds um so that's that's indeed one of the reasons and i guess the the, the investment rate bond market is much bigger than the high yield bond market mm -hmm. um in terms of amounts so that's another reason so can i just ask you then so because your model has all these different components um is there anything that would actually predict this because what in terms of the difference that occurs with the high yield bonds again so it goes back to my original mm -hmm. question that i keep pestering <laughs> about mm -hmm. uh about the inventory costs that you have, or rather mark-to-market -market risk that you face. So mm -hmm. it would be really nice if you could actually find find a uh, you know you know something which is in intrinsic to the securities or the, the the particular bonds that would give you that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and to think about it, indeed, we could we could think of some heterogeneity among the the AP costs, as you said, and the and the bond costs that could give you some equilibrium outcome. What we see in terms of average inventories in the data. Well, uh, so here's yeah. one thing, for instance, your mark to mark is, is I mean, as I said, it's a temporary thing. There's the chances mm -hmm. are that it it will uh, readjust faster in the high yield bond, in the low, in the investment grade bonds, because they're simply more frequently traded and there's high liquidity, blah, 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 right? So maybe there should, there's a missing parameter there that would give you that. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. Thanks for the suggestion. And I'm, I mean, other question, um, suppose you had a, Interdealer market, bond market in the model. Do you need this to be for your results to go through? Do you need this to be um, friction, um, like a frictional market? So if you had a frictionless market, I mean, I assume the price impact would sort of have to show up in that interdealer market as well. Um, uh, for, so I'm not sure whether you have thought about this. Uh, mm. So, so uh, as I said already, basically what we need is that there is a representative AP. It could be an aggregation of several dealers and then the interdealer market. But what, what is important for the mechanism of the model to work through is that the, the marginal AP who is redeeming um, uh, ETF shares has some inventory in the bonds. And that's that's basically what we find in it because of this asymmetry between redemptions and creations. Indeed, it could be some, some intermediation chain in the middle um, that the AP redeems the bond and then sells to another AP or to another dealer. Uh, that's fine within the within our model as long as the marginal AP who's redeeming um, the representative AP who's redeeming has some inventory in the bonds for the buffer function to function uh, during redemptions. All right. 
if there are no other questions, then I would like to thank everybody to attend the session, and I would like to uh, to to thank uh, to thank Kamar Kamarfil for for his great presentation. Um, again, just as a reminder, in the chat we have posted the link to uh, a conference from the NYSE on microstructure and AI. If you're interested, please follow that link. And other than that, thank you so much for attending, and uh, we'll all see you again in two weeks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.